this is Craig Brown, and welcome to Passages. Passages is a space to explore Bible passages used for preaching, reflection, and prayer. My hope is that Passages will shine a unique light on text used for preaching at the First Free Methodist Church of Seattle or for anyone looking to dive deeper into the Bible. Today's passage is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. It's the basis for the sermon at First Free Methodist Church on November 12, 2023. It's part of our series called Safety Measures. And this series will have a focus on how to shape and define our boundaries as God's people. Let's begin by hearing the verse from the passage of scripture that is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, a segment from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking and he says, Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, take no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you take an oath by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. But make your statement as this, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil origin. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is offering us some teaching about a greater form of righteousness. And this particular passage of Scripture occurs where Jesus is moving through different components of Jewish law, some of them in the Ten Commandments, some in other parts of the Jewish law. And he's helping those who are hearing and helping us reinterpret these things. He has already addressed the topics of uh, murder and adultery, by defining this greater righteousness. He said murder, for example, isn't just killing another person. It's actually harboring any kind of hate or ill intent toward another person. And then with adultery, which we would normally think of having a relationship with someone that is not your spouse, Jesus reinterprets that to say, not only is it that, but it is any kind of lust that drives us in terms of how we see and how we understand other human beings around us. And in this particular passage, the greater righteousness teaching Jesus is offering is about oaths. Now, it's a departure from the rest of the teaching in this section because the first two parts of this greater righteousness section in Matthew's gospel were about items in what's called the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. Now he transitions to a conversation about other laws or other traditions of his day. And in this particular section, he's talking about the use of vows as a biblical standard. And what he cites in verse 33 is from Leviticus 19 verse 12 and from Numbers 30 verse 2. And it's about how one could use a vow to enhance one's statement to witness one's own commitment to truth-telling. Now, that's a complicated way of saying something, but actually I think we all understand somewhat well. It's similar to the way uh, we think of making a promise versus making a statement. It's the difference between uh, a comment, a commitment, and a contract. So this is a practice commonly accepted in Jesus' day, especially as a way for making a statement but yet providing a little bit more force to it. Now, before we get into how this works, let's just pause for a moment and take this key passageway away from what we've read so far even. That our words convey meaning, character, and grounding. Now, it may be simple enough to say, but words mean something. You see, vows were an important part of Jewish life in Jesus' day, and we'll discuss that more in a moment. But we need to first hear that how we communicate and how we keep our sense of integrity through what we communicate are important, not just to us, but to God. Jesus is leaning us into a space to ensure that what we say matters, 
words are not casual. And, and there's an incarnational principle here. Uh, keep in mind, remember that Jesus is is the word of God, the communication of God. The Gospel of John calls Jesus the logos, the, the word, the idea, the notion of who God is. And so in him is truth. So we need to practice the same kind of importance and intentionality to what we say as well. Now in verses 34 35 and 36, we can turn our attention to the, the problem with vows. Now, by the time of Jesus, there were a whole set of rabbinic practices around vows. It went well beyond the, the prescription that we read about vows in Leviticus 19 and Numbers 30. There was a, a whole tradition that had developed around how vows were used for people. Think of it as a way of ranking vows by what you swear to. Uh, it's common within my culture uh, uh, for an individual to say, um, I swear on my mother's grave. <laughs> and so this is the same notion here that, that, you're, that what one is trying to do is reinforce the strength of what they've said or to shore up its integrity. I'm, I'm not just telling you this. I swear on my mother's grave this. And Jesus outlines in this text the various ways vows were ranked. In other words, there was actually a, a hierarchy of vows. He said that some people take a vow by heaven. Some people take a vow by earth. Some people take a vow by Jerusalem. Some people take a vow of their head. The hierarchy of vows was how others demonstrated their forcefulness of their statement. So making a vow by heaven, for example, was more of a commitment than taking a vow by your head. So it's almost like you could rank how strong a statement or a commitment was based on what the individual vowed to go along with it. This might seem a little ridiculous to us, but this is a keen part of Jewish culture in Jesus's day. The issue here is how these vows were used to, it wasn't about, in Jesus's time, about how they were used to strengthen statements. But here's the problem. They were used to create laxity about those statements or to even break them. So the whole practice around vows in Jesus's day had become corrupt. People would oftentimes take or make vows of less force so they could more easily be broken. So the practice was not about one's commitment to truth but it actually had become about the acceptability of lying. You know, other Jewish groups confronted this problem as well. There's another uh, Jewish group in the time of Jesus called the Essenes. These were uh, individuals that embraced a more kind of a pragmatic way of living the Jewish life and the Jewish faith. They lived out into the desert, out in the desert near the Jordan River. There were many who believed that John the Baptist himself was one of the Essenes. Uh, our discovery, for example, in the 20th century of the Dead Sea Scrolls were likely um, curated by these communities that would eventually be called the Essenes. So as Jesus explores these various vows and how they're ranked, what he does in this passage of Scripture in verses 34, 35, and 36 is he says, well, to be honest, all these vows are the same. And so he ties them all to the same God. He says, well, if you swear by heaven, that's the throne of God. If you swear by earth, that's the footstool of God. If you swear by Jerusalem, that's the city of the great king. If you swear by your head, well, changing your head, in other words, the color of the hair on your head is something that in Jesus's perspective here is only God could do that. That opens up a key passageway to us, all of it, in that our words and character must be affirmative, not just plausible. Now, this may again sound like stating the obvious, but God, there's such an important nuance here. Sometimes for us uh, in the 21st century, we employ silence as a vow of sorts. So by saying nothing, we actually commit to nothing. And so by saying nothing or communicating nothing, even in the face of statements that might be outrageous, 
we define a safe place for ourselves, plausibility, deniability. And what Jesus is pointing to is this, is that God is in all things and sees all things, including our intent, our intent in speaking, our intent in being silent, our intent in writing something, our intent in not writing it. So the work of words and character is to be clear and affirmative, not evasive or lacking clarity. In the time of Jesus, these vows were used by individuals so that they could almost kind of hedge their bets, if you will, to somehow imply that what they're saying isn't what they really mean and they want the capacity to back out of it. And in a similar way, we struggle with some of the same issues. It's hard for us to embrace this way of living where our words and our character must be affirmative, not just plausible. Perhaps this teaching corrects our own lack of authenticity. Perhaps it confronts even our misuse of the divine name, our careless use of the word God or Lord. Who knows? But suffice to say that Jesus is inviting us to see our words and our character in a new, different, and much more important light. As this text comes to an end, Jesus gives clarity about the direction. In verse 34, he said, I say to you, take no oath at all. And now in verse 37, he begins to make clear exactly what he's saying. But make sure your statement is yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil origin. So Jesus, like the Essene community, now makes it clear how we're to communicate. That The text literally says, if you're yes, yes, or no, no. He rejects this idea of, of overly being nuanced or qualified. Now, he doesn't mean this to be demonstrative. In other words, this is a way of being cruel to other people. Instead, Jesus is arguing for a way of life that is transparent with others as it is with God. God knows if our yes is yes and our no is no. And so the text literally says, if it's yes, then say yes. If it's no, say no. Simplicity eliminates the need for guessing. Vows, he says, are a pathway to evil since they enable a deformity of character or a hedging, if you will, a pattern of deceit. Jesus tells us in clear terms, there's no need for vows. The followers of Jesus are characterized by their clarity of speech and words. That opens a final key passageway for us. Communicate with clarity as one who is seen by God. Again, this is hard work to do. We assume wrongly that there are times in our lives where we can somehow deceive others and even deceive God. We can hedge our bets. No, we have a commitment, Jesus tells us, to be clear in our communication. There's no need between, no need to read between the lines for the followers of Jesus. What this means is that we have to have a sense of security with our, our own self and who we are in Christ, and that we have clarity of our own thoughts and clarity about our own prayers. So ultimately, our answers can be yes if it's yes, or no if it's no. What it boils down to is this, is that we have to communicate with others, no matter how we communicate, in writing, in speech, whatever it is we do, we have to communicate with others in the same frame that we communicate with God. Authenticity, integrity, transparency, clarity. If you have comments and reflections, I'd love to hear from you. Please visit my website at revcraig.com. Click on News in the upper right-hand corner, and you'll see a drop-down menu that says Podcasts on it. If you click on podcast, then you can click on this week's episode and leave a comment. I'd also encourage you to visit our church's website, ffmc.org, to learn more about free Methodism and how you can connect with our community. I bid you all grace. Thanks for listening. 
and we'll see you next time.